to part two of John Nardini's episode on mathematical modeling of wound healing and how machine learning has helped speed up the discovery process. This is the part with all of John's cool visual material, so be sure to hop onto YouTube to make the most of this episode and all the cool stuff that he's done. This is the second episode of a weekly series on the precision medicine work that's happening at SAMSI. So if you want to hear more about when new episodes are coming out, don't forget to subscribe and click that bell button. And with that, John, you've got some really cool stuff, so I'm just going to stop talking. And let's get to it. Yeah, Glenn, uh, thank you so much for having me today. Why don't we hop over to my presentation and I'll show you. So yeah, now I'll just be going through some slides talking about learning PDE models from noisy spatiotemporal data. So as I mentioned in the previous talk, during my PhD dissertation, I was very interested in deriving partial differential equation or PDE models to describe the wound healing process. And so here I actually have uh, to the right a video of some of the scratch assay experiments that were conducted, where we're simply watching a population of cells migrate to the right in response to some artificial wound that was created for an experiment. And then below this experiment, I've depicted a simulation of a mathematical model that I use to quantify the migration of the cell population into the wound area during these experiments. And so as I talked about in the previous talk, this is a partial differential equation where I was able to derive what I would call a nonlinear diffusion equation model, where this is an equation of the form that says that if we have some cell density U and we're interested in how it changes over time, we could give it an equation where on the right-hand side, we say that the rate of change of our cell density is equal to both a diffusion term quantifying how these cells spread into the open area as well as another term that incorporates these cell-cell interactions. So if you remember from the previous portion of the talk, I was talking about how some initially I thought that cells prevented cell migration into the wound, but eventually I used mathematical modeling to understand that really cells help each other move into the wound area. And this is actually the mathematical model here, a partial differential equation model to describe how cells can simultaneously migrate into the wound area and push their neighbors into the wound area with them. And so this is just an example of a case where I could describe the mechanics that were relevant for the given data set that we were working with. But often we're working with collaborators and we ask them, well, what's going on inside this experiment? And they maybe have no idea. And they have a whole laundry list of things that could or could not be occurring. For example, maybe there's diffusion, meaning that these cells do indeed sort of migrate towards empty space. But also from a mathematical standpoint, this can be challenging because we sort of have very simple form of diffusion that we call Fickian. Or in more complicated scenarios, there's another thing called nonlinear diffusion. And the models for these two can be very different. Furthermore, maybe cells aren't simply spreading into empty space. Maybe they have some sort of directed form of migration, for example, due to those chemical that I was telling you about previously. And so mathematically, we would call this advection, in which case cells have some predefined orientation that they like to migrate towards. And this could include what we would call chemotaxis, in which case cells move towards some chemical gradients, or even haptotaxis, where there are things on the ground that cells anchor to, and they may want to, again, move towards increasing gradients of these anchors on the floor. And this is only just some of the possibilities for how cells move. And this is completely ignoring how cell population in general may be growing over time. And there are many different mathematical models to describe how these cell populations grow over time. For example, logistic or exponential growth models. And there are a whole slew of other things that may or may not be going on. And so the idea here is that there are, in general, a large number of assumptions that may be going on for our biological data sets, and in turn, a large number of mathematical models that could potentially describe experimental data. And so for those who are not watching right now, and the slide, I have a little figure where there is a circle representing experimental data, as well as a representation of a long laundry list of assumptions to the left of this experimental data and the resulting mathematical models that could form from our n different assumptions. And so just to highlight a few of these, I've highlighted what the mathematical model may look like if we only have cell diffusion, or cells are diffusing and logistically growing, or just chemotaxing. And just to emphasize how long this list is, I keep going and then say maybe there's n different assumptions where with the less we know, n is going to get larger and larger. 
And so the typical way we go about this in the mathematical modeling literature is we would then actually simulate each of these n mathematical models, which can be a time consuming and difficult process. And then we compare them to experimental data. And then we get some sort of score to say how well each one of our mathematical models could describe this data. This is often called an information criterion. If you're familiar, you could think of this as like an Akaiki information criterion. And then we just select whichever one of these information criteria tells us that that mathematical model is most informative. And so from this long list of n mathematical models, we finally infer that, oh, maybe our nth model was the one that best described the experimental data. But the issue here is that we have to actually specify these n different models. And just specifying that one mathematical model during my PhD dissertation took essentially five years. And so if n is something like 100, you definitely don't want to spend the next 500 years coming up with every single possible model for these assumptions that may or may not even be true for a given data set. So John, really quickly, when we think about an information criterion for a statistical model, typically what we think of is a description of how well we describe the data and subtract from it the complexity of the model. For the mathematical models that you're describing, is there a, what is the penalty of the complexity? Is it how many terms or how many parameters in the model? What is that complexity penalty? Yeah, so if you actually look at the AIC score, it typically penalizes due to the number of parameters that have to be inferred for the mathematical model. And so if you have a mathematical model with a large number of terms, in general, each one of those terms is going to have its own parameter that needs to be estimated from the data itself. And so certainly the more things that you include in your mathematical model, the more parameters you're going to have to estimate, which will lead to a higher penalization in your AIC score. So we are still looking for simple models with only a small number of terms that need to be inferred. And so you get the idea from the previous slide that it can be a very time consuming process to go through every single one of these combinations and then compare them to the experimental data. So this has led us to the equation learning where we're more interested in going directly from experimental data to an inferred model or small number of models that could maybe describe our data. And then once we actually have these models, we could use our expertise as mathematical modelers to better understand the true assumptions of what's going on in our biological experience. Experiment. Unfortunately, this field of equation learning is a pretty new field. And so the current state of the art is to actually do a simulation study. It's not yet been fully investigated on actual experimental data. And so the typical type of artificial data generation study is that we have some, some mathematical model that denotes by F here in point one. And so we know what F is. And then we're going to simulate this mathematical model by simulating that the time change in U is equal to this specified F function. And that will give us a simulation of a partial differential equation model. And then to imitate noisy data, what we'll do is just add noise to our clean partial differential equation simulation to imitate what noisy data might look like. And then from this noisy data, our goal is to uncover the right-hand side to our mathematical model that we called F previously. And later on, I'll be focusing on two different versions of F, which include the advection diffusion equation, which is relevant to biological phenomena when a process is moving with some orientation and also spreading, or the Fisher-KPP or fisher komogorov petrovsky piskunov equation, which imitates a process where we have a biological process that is both spreading but also growing like Logistically. Just very quickly on the slide that you just showed, yeah. you know, there's a one of the difficulties of generating data is really difficult to derive those like sort of non-noise artifacts and the oddities of real life data. How do you handle that in order to make sure that this data that you're generating synthetically is going to be as useful as possible in the real world settings? So we haven't actually addressed that at this moment in time where we are still just sort of adding a pretty simple form of noise to our simulation studies. But the one thing that we have done that was unique as compared to previous studies is that you'll notice that we have what we would call a proportional error model, where as the solution to our PDE model grows, so does the noise. And this is actually a true assumption for many biological phenomena, with the idea that if you have more cells to count or something of that nature, then it's much harder to count it accurately. You know, you can think of this as if you have an image with three cells, it's pretty easy to count one, two, three, three cells. So you won't have much error on that analysis. Whereas if you think about an experimental image with, say, 10,000 cells, well, then you're probably going to have a pretty hard time accurately counting the number of cells in that population. So we haven't quite done enough to really imitate some of the 
bigger challenges that we see in biological data, but we are, you know, attempting to make this thing more biologically realistic. That is really interesting, John, how you know about the measurement process well enough that you can incorporate that into your synthetic data. That's a really cool addition, I'd have to say. But I won't delay you any further because I know there's some other cool slides coming up. Cool. Yeah. So this image just sort of shows what this entire equation learning framework looks like, where on the left, we're looking at just a spatial profile of our artificial simulation. And then as we move right, we're going through our equation learning process to infer a partial differential equation that can describe this. But we actually split this process into two separate steps to make it a little bit easier, where the first step we call data denoising, where we go from this noisy data set and from that, try and obtain a clean version of what our data set looks like. And from this clean version of our data set, also estimate its derivatives or how it changes with respect to both time and space, labeled as DUDT or DUDX in the middle portion of this slide. And then once we have these clean estimates on our data, as well as how it changes over time and space, we can then use these as inputs to an equation learning framework to try and determine the mathematical model that best describes this process. And so this field of equation learning is not novel. It's been worked on previously, but we looked, sort of looked at the current state of the art algorithms and saw a lot of challenges for this type of methodology that we often see with biological data. And this includes large noise levels. So data that's very, very noisy. We'll see in the next few slides that the previous state of the art algorithms really struggle when the data is not clean, as well as complicated statistical models, such as the proportional error model that I told you about in the previous slides, as well as worked with only a few time samples where many biological processes we may only be able to observe two, three, four, five times. So can we still recover their equation with only limited information? As well as what I would call heterogeneity between samples, where maybe if we do the experiments twice, the parameters underlying the process may be drastically different between these two experiments. And so when realizations of our data change between two experiments, how do these equation learning processes perform? So I've actually been working very closely with a graduate student at NC State for this first step of data denoising. And this is John Lagergren, who is in the math department at NC State. And again, the idea for this data denoising step is to go from noisy data and figure out a clean version of the data that we can accurately estimate how it changes over both time and space. And the previous state of the art from equation learning methods was to use polynomial splines to denoise the data, where the basic idea is you look at a small number of points in your data, and then you're going to fit a very simple mathematical function to this small number of data points, a polynomial. And then we have very easy ways to say how these polynomials change over time, called polynomial splines. That was the previous way that we would obtain cleaner versions of the data and its derivatives, or how they change, was through polynomial splines. But what we observed is that when we add even small amounts of noise to the data, for example, just 5% noise, then we're very unable to accurately show how our given data set changes in both time and space x. So for example, in a current video that I'm showing, we're using polynomial splines to fit a given artificial simulation in the left where the data is slightly noisy. And what we see is that in the bottom panel, we're trying to estimate how our cell density changes over both time space and how its second spatial derivative changes over time. And we see the very inaccurate estimates for each of these, where these first order derivatives are pretty noisy as compared to their true values in black. And then if we look at our second spatial derivative, we see that it gets extremely noisy as time progresses. So we identified that these current algorithms were very inaccurate at properly denoising the data. And so we wanted to make a methodology that could make this a bit more robust to large noise levels in data. And that led us to using an artificial neural network, where this would be what we'd call a single hidden layer feed forward neural network. The basic idea here is that instead of using polynomials to approximate the given data sets, we're going to use a neural network to do so. And so remember that each point of our data, it has some corresponding cell density that we call U. And the idea behind this neural network is that we have two inputs, the spatial point and the time point. And we just want this neural network to be able to predict what the cell density looks like at this given time and given spatial location. And for those who are a bit more familiar with neural networks, it's a single hidden layer feed forward network and we used a soft plus activation functions and found that we could get a neural network that trains very accurately to the given data set.
And so now I'm showing the results of using this neural network approach for a given simulation with 10% noise, which is twice the noise level that we saw with the polynomial splines. And in this case, we see that the neural network is able to very closely estimate how our cell density changes over time, space, as well as its second spatial derivative. And this is with 10% noise, and we can even go even higher up to 25% noise but we still see very realistic derivative estimates from this neural network approach. So that is our conclusion for the first part of our equation learning framework, where we use this artificial neural network to go from very noisy data to clean versions of the data, as well as how it changes over both time and space. And now we're going to use these clean estimates in an equation learning framework to figure out the mathematical model that can best describe these clean estimates of our data. This methodology isn't brand new. It was actually came up with in 2017 out of Nathan Cutts' lab from the University of Washington. But the idea behind this methodology is that, in general, these mathematical models take the form of, we think our, say, cell density changes over time given some candidate terms on the right-hand side of a given mathematical model. And in general, if we don't know anything about what the right-hand side of our mathematical model might look like, then we could just come up with a library of many potential terms that may or may not be included in our model. And of course, each of these terms correspond to different assumptions about the given process. And so in this library of terms that I'll call theta, we go up to polynomials of order p with respect to u. These would correspond to what we call reaction terms that would describe both how the cell density may grow or decay over time. And then we also include derivative estimates over x. So we're talking about how our cell density changes over space. And these terms we would call transport terms which tend to talk about how our cell population moves over time, where, for example, the first spatial derivative would be advection, where things move with a directed orientation, whereas the second spatial derivative corresponds to the spreading of a substance, where it just spreads into empty space. And then the idea is we have this large library of potential terms, so we could actually just solve a linear system where we maybe have a vector corresponding to how this density changes over time, as well as a large library theta of potential terms. And then we just have parameters in front of each one of these terms that we call a vector xi. And so we can sort of identify this as a linear system that we could use linear regression to solve for this unknown vector xi that parameterizes each of these terms. And as I sort of mentioned all the way back in the beginning of this talk, we really don't want a mathematical model with 15 terms on it or something, because it's going to be very difficult to analyze and understand what it's doing. So instead, we use methods of sparse regression to get a small number of terms for our inferred model so that we can more easily interpret what's going on for the biological data. And so just as an example, we could consider this to be our library of terms, 1, u, u squared, ux, u times ux, u squared times ux, and uxx. And if we inferred that the corresponding vector is 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, 2, then that would correspond to u minus u squared plus 2 times u sub xx. And then as a mathematical modeler, I would identify that as the Fisher KPP equation that I discussed earlier. So we can now go through the results that we've had so far in learning two different types of mathematical models from this process. And so again, we're here looking at an advection diffusion equation, which describes how our process both migrates in some given orientation over time, but it also spreads. And then as we go further down, we're comparing the spline approach as well as the neural network approach. And as we go down, we're adding more and more noise to the given data set. And what we see is that with 5% noise, both the spline and the neural network can lead to the correct equation. But then at higher noise levels of 10% and 25%, the splines don't give us information that the concentration is spreading, whereas the neural network does let us know that there is both advection and spreading going on. But then at 50% noise, we do start to get one incorrect term with the neural network approach. So we see that it works with 25% noise, but not at 50% noise.
Similarly, we can use the Fisher KPP equation where we have something that is spreading as well as logistically growing. And if we look at even just 5% noise again, we see that polynomial splines don't give us insight into how the cell population is spreading, whereas the neural network does at both 5% and 10% noise. And then at 25% noise, we do get the correct equation for both systems. So the neural network can provide us with insights up to 10% noise in this case, whereas the polynomial splines never gave us insight into the true model. I also mentioned that we've been doing this in collaboration with oncologists from the Mayo Clinic. And when we brought these results to them, they were impressed. But what they told us was, you have way too many time samples when you do these types of experiments because they're working with MRI data for glioblastoma patients. And so if they get five realizations of this process, then they think they have a lot of temporal information. Whereas we were using something like 100 different data points to get this. So we've now been working on the um, effectiveness of this equation learning framework with the neural network with a small number of time points to imitate this process. And in this slide here, I'm comparing parameter regimes that would correspond to what they would call a slow tumor. And what we see is that with even only three time points, we can actually infer the correct mathematical model of a slow tumor. But then if we go to a different parameter regime that imitates a fast tumor, we see that even with 10 time points, we cannot get the correct equation for this fast tumor. And we think this is because if we look at the solution to this fast tumor over time, we see that it sort of has a constant profile that's moving right and left. This is in two dimensions, so it's actually spreading radially outwards with a constant profile. And this constant profile can be a challenge for these equation learning frameworks because due to our analysis, we know that many different types of mathematical models can lead to this type of simulation. So we could actually remedy this by shortening the time span over which the tumor is allowed to grow. And so instead of going from zero to three years like we do in this figure, we could shorten the time scale from zero to half of a year and in this case, the solution to the mathematical model has not yet developed that constant profile. And in this case, we can actually get the dynamics of the fast tumor with as few as five time points. So that's getting us now down to a biologically realistic number of time points of five, so long as we sample over a shorter time period with these fast tumors. And so the conclusion from this slides are that we were able to extend the PD find methodology by using a neural network to denoise the data as opposed to using polynomial splines. And we see that we can now infer the underlying mathematical model from data with pretty high amounts of noise ranging from 10 to 25 percent, whereas the previous methodology has failed around 5 percent. And we're also working to make this more applicable to biological scenarios where we maybe only have a small number of time points to work with, as well as different tumor types. So I'll wrap up there, but I just want to mention that I've had some really great collaborators for this project at both NC State University and the Mayo Clinic, as well as the University of Nottingham. And if people are interested, we have a preprint on archive for this work. Well, John, that was really great. Thanks so much. As I really love the animations, you clearly put a lot of effort in trying to explain this to the audience. So definitely don't miss this out on the YouTube channel or watching the videos. John, thanks again for your time. Yeah, Glenn, thank you. It's been my great pleasure to be here talking with you about this today. So thank you.